Shivani ma'am, we are live now. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. M. L. Dhanukar College of Commerce welcomes you all to the national webinar on conserving energy, sustaining life. A study by the International Energy Agency stated that the universe is projected to continue consumption of 2% more energy each year than it consumed the past year, thus leading to depletion of energy resources. A bright and happy future is only possible when we pledge to conserve energy in every possible way. Through this webinar, PTVA's ML Dhanukar College of Commerce is attempting to make students aware of the hazards of energy wastage and ways in which the student community can help to conserve energy and build a sustainable world. Today, we have amongst us our esteemed resource person, Dr. Vivek Kulkarni, NABET accredited, EIA coordinator, and A category field area expert for ecology and biodiversity. Dr. D.M. Doke, our respected principal, Srimati Chandana Chakraborty, our respected vice principal, and my dear faculty colleagues. I now request Dr. D.M. Doke, our respected principal, to kindly deliver the welcome address and formally announce the opening of this session. Over to you, sir. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, Shivani, I was not at all prepared for this. I thought you people are going to manage entire yes, event sir. and I was Just to two words it. of encouragement. So, okay, okay, sir. Sir, uh, I am not in India, so I am in this sweater and all that. I am at 7 degree temperature. So, sorry, I am not in formals also. Uh, I welcome you on behalf of Palitra Kiddari Association, Samil Anukar College of Commerce. And as I told you, this is the theme of G20, that sustainable environment, energy and all those things they are talking about. And uh, therefore, to create awareness among the students, of course, it should have been long back, but it is better late uh, than uh, never. So we are working towards it. And this is the first step of uh, creating awareness through a lecture series like yours. Welcome to the Hanukkah College. And thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you sir. Your inspiring words were needed just to the beginning of this session. Thank you so much, Dukhe, sir. It is truly an honor for me to introduce our esteemed resource person for this webinar, Dr. Vivek Kulkarni. Dr. Vivek Kulkarni, as I mentioned, is an NEBET accredited, EIA coordinator and A category field area expert for ecology and biodiversity for building environment, India Private Limited. He has uh, EIA experience in building construction, townships, area development, industrial estates, Trans Harbor Links, Ports and Harbors. He is also a coastal ecology expert with global experience in in situ conservation. Dr. Kulkarni possesses over 14 years of experience in CSR and CER with Godrej and Voice Manufacturing Company Limited. He has immense corporate professional experience as head of garden department, horticulture and landscaping, waste management, ISO, IMS, NEBS, NEBL standards, green buildings, environmental impact assessment and environmental clearance, clean development mechanism and challenges from global warming. Sir has also worked on several prestigious projects, one of which is Mumbai Coastal Road Project, the Mumbai Trans Harbor Link Project, etc., and that too in strategic positions. He is an empaneled member of Environment Cell CITCO, in addition to being a member of several esteemed committees. He has conducted research projects on vegetation mapping and biological surveys of different coastal areas in India and ecological footprint and carrying capacity of Mumbai. Dr. Vivek Kulkarni has been involved in environmental education, training, and capacity building since 1987, and he has trained several thousand people to various programs. He is an outdoor expert with roots, countryside, WWF India, Mumbai, uh, Bombay Natural History Society, etc. He has been regularly contributing to newspapers, magazines, and documentaries with reference to environmental awareness. He has also been interviewed by several news channels for contributions in the field of environmental safety. In addition to that, Sir has also been a co-guide and guide for several science students at master's and degree level. 
He has trained mangrove restoration hydrological approach under a program conducted by Mangrove Action Project under the guidance of Roy Robin Lewis, Florida. And he's also been training in environmental leadership from NITI. Sir has several accolades to his credit. I've only been able to uh, speak of a few over here on this platform. Uh, sir, I would like to say it is indeed a huge privilege for us to have such a multifaceted personality like yourself as our resource person. We are now geared up to commence this impactful and enlightening session. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, we could have saved a little more energy uh... Uh, instead of giving all this information. Uh, but uh, anyway, thank you very much. I'm uh, sharing the screen now. So a very good afternoon. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. So when we talk about energy, we have all been knowing about the word energy. And most of the energetic students are uh, sitting over there and uh, listening to this uh, conversation and seeing the watching the presentation. So basically, energy is defined as ability or capacity to do work. So whatever work we are doing, uh, it requires energy. We require energy for our own body parts for which uh, the fuel comes from the food. Uh, whereas uh, when we, when machines work, the energy is coming from something else, which can be in terms of fuel or the uh, different kinds of energies which are there. So energy lights are cities. Cars are vehicles, runs machinery, factories, it warms, schools are homes. Sir is sitting over there at 7 degrees Celsius. Uh, well, I was uh, uh, a couple of months back uh, working at minus 40 degrees Celsius. So you need to conserve your energy at such cold places. You tend to gain a lot of energy when you're working in hot climates. So all this is related to energy. And one thing about energy is whenever you think of energy, you need to think of in terms of carbon because carbon is uh, released into the environment whenever energy is converted or whenever the energy is put to work. In uh, ancient times, energy uses were basically based on the solar energy or there were animals which were used for uh, performing the energetic tasks. And of course, long ago, people learned how to use water power to turn paddle wheels and wind power for transportation and irrigation, etc. Uh, I don't know if any of you have visited any of these uh, uh, windmills or water mills. Uh, for example, if you have visited uh, uh, Aurangabad city, you can uh, see the uh, uh, there is a uh, mill for grinding uh, uh, grains, uh, which is working on the water power. So such kind of things were existing uh, since a long time uh, onto the earth. People also learn to use chemical energy stored in materials like wood to cook and heat their homes. And this is the prophet of energy, Dr. James Watt. We all have read about it and how he saw the uh, kettle uh, uh, thundering because of the uh, vapor pressure which was there and that gave him the idea for uh, creating the steam engines. And uh, he has contributed immensely into the entire industrial revolution, uh, not only in the Great Britain, but in the rest of the world. So 
so machines and technologies introduced during the industrial revolution of late 18th century required the use of other energy resources especially fossil fuel because now earlier the scenario was the production was uh, scattered it was at household level and at minimalistic energy people used to work but when the industry started you needed to manufacture at long, large scale and whenever you need to manufacture at large scale you need to have captive energy which has to be there for transforming the different materials into products so we have uh, two kinds of energies uh, what is one is known as renewable energy which is the energy obtained from sources that are essentially inexhaustible okay such as sun wind tidal uh, powers etc and <coughs> there is something called non renewable energy this is the energy that comes from the ground and it is not replaced in relatively short amount of time uh, most of you must be knowing that uh, the fossil fuels which we have were basically the huge rain forests which were there that were buried in the earth for years together and the carbon from that was compressed and they turned into coal deposits oil deposits or gas deposits which is essentially being harnessed and today all over the world non renewable energy is basically the major source of energy which is being utilized whereas the contribution of renewable energy is substantially less so examples of renewable energy are solar energy wind energy hydro power biomass geothermal tidal energy wave energy and otec what is called as ocean thermal energy conversion so let's look at solar energy so i have most people are under the influence that uh, renewable energy is always good always clean and there is a much hype about all these things however we need to understand for any energy whether it is renewable or non renewable there are pros and there are cons and while using or choosing which kind of energy you need to choose you need to understand both the advantages as well as the disadvantages so what are the advantages of solar energy it decreases use of non renewable resources must needed then reduces power bill energy independence long term savings low maintenance benefits the community Okay, drivers, diverse uses are there. Power prices are rising, and technology is improving, and prices are decreasing, especially for the solar energy. What are the disadvantages? You have high upfront costs. Yeah, okay. you need to have the solar energy. Either you can use it from. the photovoltaic cells you convert it into the electrical impulses and utilize that electricity or you can use it in uh, uh, thermal heating uh, setups like the solar power heat or water heating or solar uh, chulas etc where you can use it as thermal energy uh it is sunlight dependent even if you want to put it on your uh, terrace it has to have a particular angle in which only it can be seen uh and it can be utilized uh then you have space constraints now a lot of these solar energy uh, projects require large areas and uh, you for example for a building like it's a 70 story or 80 story building the a sunlight which is available can be taken from roof mainly and uh, the footprint of these buildings is very less so uh, it's a space constraint to have maximum amount of solar energy 
environmental impact of manufacturing because the manufacturing of uh, solar pv panels uh, uh, require a lot of uh, minerals it requires uh, uh, specific technologies which again emit uh, uh, pollution and then the disposal of the cells is another uh, problem then difficulty with relocation once you have located you cannot just dismantle and put it somewhere else uh, these materials which are required for preparing the photovoltaic cells uh, there is a scarcity of that and as i said disposal recycling options may be limited uh, besides that uh, in rajasthan uh, uh, because it's a, a low uh, rain area rainfall area uh, we have large setups for uh, solar energy. Now, problem is whenever you have covered these large areas, uh, they do not function anymore as a habitat. So there is a habitat destruction, uh, which may cause because of this. And also the transportation of uh, this uh, electricity. Uh, you may have heard of a bird called Great Indian Bustard. Uh, there are all 100 odd birds now uh, living in the wild uh, and they are all concentrated in Gujarat and Rajasthan. And uh, these are clumsy birds to, for flight and large uh, wingspans, so they get electrocuted very fast due to the uh, transmission of these. Uh, so these kind of uh, issues uh, can be seen whenever uh, there is solar energy, which, which is being utilized. Then we come to wind energy. So you may have seen those large wind turbines. You can have a very small uh, uh, wind turbine, uh, which can give you one kilowatt per hour. To, you have large turbines, which can give you up to one megawatt. So there's a large range of uh, these uh, uh, windmills which are there. The pros is wind power is cost effective, it creates jobs, it basically is renewable and clean. Wind farms are in efficient use of land. So in, uh, instead of covering the entire land with uh, uh, solar PV panels, uh, probably the wind farms require less energy. For the cons, uh, wind can have a higher upfront investment cost again. Then some people believe that wind turbines cause noise and visual pollution, and it does because many of our scenic uh, coastlines now have these large turbines over there, and it's an ISO. Uh, wind farms can impact local wildlife, especially birds and bats, and there's a lot of research going on. Now they say that if you uh, of the three blades which you know, uh, uh, one of the blade can be black and other two can be white, and that will give more visibility for the birds while passing through those areas and they don't get hit. But a large number of birds and bats have been recorded get killed by the uh, wind turbines. And wind farm locations may be too remote and require additional transmission infrastructure. Like you cannot just set up a wind farm anywhere. Uh, you need to have a wind speed of minimum 15 to 16 kilometers an hour. And that's where the uh, wind farms can be really set up. Whereas in most places, the uh, uh, wind speed is restricted to four to five kilometers an hour. Yeah. Uh, then we have the hydro energy. Again, pros are it's renewable, emission free, reliable, adjustable, creates lakes, faster de de developed land. Cons are impact on fish, limited plant locations, higher initial costs, carbon and methane em emissions are there, susceptible to droughts, blood risks are there, and most of the dam projects. No, they, there's a severe loss of forest because while preparing dam, you need to have the natural mountain areas. And then at one particular uh, side of the river, you build a dam. And that is then let out into the lower areas 
for and with the power of the uh, kinetic power which is there that is transferred into you uh, are turning the turbines and converting it into electrical energy then you have something called geothermal power the geothermal power basically uses the earth naturally to generate electricity oh uh, we all know that uh, earth is quite hot at its center and there is a liquid lava which is there all along its mantle and that has heavy energy now there are ways and means to encash this particular energy and that is called a geothermal power so the pros are reliable source of power small land footprint uh, then usable for large and small scale installations the geothermal energy industry is expanding it's uh, i can give you one example like uh, two months back i was in uh, uh, ladakh and uh, in uh, the area called uh, chubatang now this area there are hot water springs now though the outside temperature was minus 25 degrees celsius there was boiling water available at these places so some of the irish engineers who had visited that place for locals they just collected this water allowed it to go through a pump and this pump would go into every room and heat the room and this entire heater concept which is working on the geothermal energy there is absolutely no Re, uh, recurring cost for running the system so they are so efficient and they could even work at minus 25 degrees celsius so it's it's a quite a handy kind of a tool which is available uh, of course it is location dependent you don't have the thermal energy coming out of the earth at every single place there are only limited areas where it can be utilized they have again high initial cost and can lead to surface instability if you try to mine it more then you have uh, tidal power now tidal power is again renewable with zero carbon emissions predictable energy generations high power output but the costs are again limited site availability it is right now too expensive to be utilized the environmental impacts are high because intertidal regions are also specific areas where there are a high number of organisms are living and uh, energy demand which is constantly high and uh, this kind of energy may not be sufficient to provide for the high energy needs then you have otec otec is basically you all know that uh, in the sea uh, the lower layer of the sea will be always cooler and because cooler water has higher density it will, it will be at lower levels and maintaining its cool temperature whereas surface water gets heated and there is a difference in temperature between the two and otec basically uses the heat exchangers and they use the hot uh, 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 sea water for giving you the energy so ocean thermal energy is again renewable energy it can be utilized continuously for 24 hours 24 by 7 it creates electricity without the discharge of greenhouse gases and different from other kind of energy the output of otec shows little daily or seasonal variations which we can find in terms of wind turbines or the uh, solar energy etc which are very much season dependent disadvantages are the expense of uh, uh, fitting the device and uh, uh, the continuance of the power plant is high uh, it causes the disruption in aquatic and marine life a constant supply of cold and warm water is needed so the plant can be built in only appropriate for 
tropical areas. It cannot be used in temperate regions. The conversion efficiency is very low, about three to four percent, because of small temperatures in between the deep water and surface water. So uh, we talked about in the initial stage, uh, the different uh, sources of energy, which can basically the, non, uh, the renewable sources of energy, which can be utilized to reduce the consumption of non-renewable sources. But there's a greater con contribution which can come from the energy conservation. Energy conservation is the practice of decreasing the quantity of energy used for the same quality and quantity of output. It can be achieved through efficient use in which case energy uh, in which case energy use is decreased while achieving a similar outcome. Energy conservation also includes prevention of misuse of energy because when you are talking about uh, uh, renewable sources, you can go on using the energy, which at times can be a misuse. So why do we conserve energy? Basically, our demands are continuously increasing about 14% per year. In 2015, 16, India's energy demand was 11 lakhs 14,408 mega units. Okay. And availability yeah. was 2.1% shorter than the requirement. Similarly, peak demand was 1,63,366 megawatts and availability was 1,48,463. 3.2% shortage. Today, we are at a shortage of about 7 to 8%. And that's why when you see that whenever the uh, heat season starts, people who are living in Mumbai are still at a very good position. But if you right now go to the villages and the outskirts of Mumbai also, the electrical supply which is there is quite less. So, continuing with why conserve energy, to make up the gap between the demand and supply, new power plants have to be installed, which requires capital and time. To meet the growing demand, it has been assessed that an additional generating capacity of 1 lakh megawatt has to be added by 2017, requiring an investment of rupees 800,000 crores. Uh, about uh, Mumbai, I would like to tell you that uh, the entire country of India has one single grid. So you have various power plants at various places and they continue feeding power in one single grid. Whereas Mumbai has a separate grid because it is an island basically. Uh, you have a separate grid. And uh, this grid has been kept separate because Mumbai being the economic uh, capital of India, you need to have stable uh, electrical power and it cannot be uh, based on the other areas where there are too many fluctuations of energy. Now, if we talk about uh, today's uh, scenario, I think about 2. Point uh, 2300 megawatt shortage is there for Mumbai and especially it is going to be increasing even more when all the metros will start running. So you cannot keep on adding more and more uh, power plants for Mumbai and that's where one of the way of doing is uh, either start conserving the energy and another one is start producing energy from non-renewable sources. So energy conservation measures can reduce power demand and prune the building up of uh, additional generating capacity to the extent it can be conserved. 
we have limited resources of fossil fuels available on earth 60% resources are consumed so far we need sustainable growth and save resources for future generations energy conservation is one way to achieve this our electrical become uh, uh, electricity bills also become less uh, it is not merely a technological issue but it encompasses much broader economic and management issues the cost effectiveness of energy conservation measures is well established as one unit of energy saved at the consumer end avoids nearly 2.5 to 3 times of capacity augmentation due to plant load factor plant availability and auxiliary power consumption also remember uh, just like water there are leakages in transmission of energy also and whenever we are uh, having these leakages there is a loss of energy during the transmission the thermal power shares about 65% of total electricity in india and also the whole world poisonous gases such as carbon monoxide nox sox and ash are released into the atmosphere causing environmental pollution carbon dioxide is released which is the main factor for global warming and climate change uh, most of you may be uh, uh, falling a prey to the new campaign which talks about ev vehicles right? so you are say, uh, if you buy a ev vehicle you can actually save the planet that's what uh, one of the ads says it really doesn't happen so because what happens is the energy which is required to charge the batteries is still coming from thermal energy and it is coming from somewhere far off and it merely comes here and just that electrical energy is being used it doesn't give the fumes of uh, all the obnoxious gases into the city but somewhere else it is definitely having an impact so in a nutshell if you look at uh, the how the energy is consumed in different sectors you will see agriculture about 5% industry a warming 49% transport is another big factor 22% 10% is residential and 14% is others so economy as a whole has a potential of using 23% of the energy which can be saved agricultural energy you can save up to 30% industrial you can save up to 25% transport up to 20% domestic and commercial up to 20% so these are the levels at which we can talk about saving the energy the nearly 10% of the electricity is consumed for lighting in the residential and commercial building this amounts to a connected load of approximately 11000 megawatt and annual electricity consumption of 50 billion kilowatt hours now that's something which is huge so energy saving in lighting system what can we do make maximum use of natural light translucent seats more windows and openings switch off when not required modify lighting layout to meet the need select light colors for interiors provide time switches pv controls photo sensors provide lighting transformer to operate at a reduced voltage install energy efficient lamps luminaries and controls clean translucent uh, a translucent sheet and luminaries regularly now these are some of the things which can be done at our ends and uh, the environmental uh, clearance system which is there for building construction projects they look almost into all of this so it's not that government is not doing anything in fact uh, every single new complex which uh, 
needs to be set up or uh, built, they need to have at least 5% of the connected load coming from the renewable energy source and at least 15% of energy conservation measures to be adopted. Okay. Now, uh, we heard about all these LED lights, incandescent light and CFLs. So, let's look at one of the comparative statements, a lifespan, okay. average lifespan of LED is 50,000 hours. Incandescent light bulbs, about 1,200. CFLs, about 8,000 hours. Watts of electricity use, LED is minimum with 6 to 8 watts, whereas comparable incandescent light bulbs will require 60 watts. CFLs will require 13 to 15. Then unit of electricity use 329 kilowatts hour per year, uh, 3285 kWh per year and 761 kWh per year. Annual operating cost 1316 per year, 13140 per year and 3068 rupees per year. So if we look at it, LED lights are one of the best way for reducing the or making the uh, choice for energy saving through these kind of lights. Now, what can be done at uh, uh, household levels or even at uh, building levels is to one is separate lighting transformer. Uh, you know that all the energy which comes to, especially electrical energy which comes to your houses, it comes from the electrical cables and then there is a transformer. The transformer will convert particular amount of energy for your use, okay? Which works at two levels. One is maximum, uh, uh, one is connected load and one is maximum demand load. Uh, connected load is much more than the maximum demand load to give you a stable electrical supply. So suppose what, what happens if uh, transformers are not there? All our requirements of energy as very, are variable. For example, if you are going to be sitting in your house, work from home during the uh, summer vacation, you want your, your AC to be working all the time, your uh, fans are working, your computers are working, your chargers are working. So, it's a continuous demand and uh, suppose uh, you are suddenly out on the vacation. What do you do with that additional energy which is going to be there? It's not that just our uh, lights buttons are switched off. That means that energy is not coming to my house. It is coming right over there and getting disconnected. There are losses due to that also. And that's why you have transformers, which are basically giving you a standard uh, supply, which is as per requirement. Okay, you need to isolate the from the power feeder. You need to avoid voltage fluctuation problems and energy saving at minimum voltages. Then you have uh, uh, install servo stabilizer if separate transformer is not feasible. You can use electronic ballast, you know, which again in the, gives you energy saving of 30 to 35 percent, less heat load into AC room. Then metal allied in, in place of mercury and SVL lamps and CFT in place of incandescent lamps. Fans are used extensively in summer months, use of high efficiency fan motor and use of electronic regulator in place of conventional resistance, you know, can lead to about 20% saving in energy. You can use more aerodynamic designs 
and improved impellers which will again further reduce the consumption of the fat secondly uh, many place times people think that uh, uh, can i just take a one minute uh, halt sure sir मीटिंग में हुए दो पांच मिनट में हाँ हाँ ठीक या I'm sorry for that there was a essential call okay uh, so uh, we every time we leave a room you switch off the fan and every time you enter the room you start the fan but uh, this doesn't work because to start a fan it requires much uh, larger energy okay second part thing is about efficiency of the refrigerators in india it's rather poor you still may be looking at a uh, five star rating on the uh, refrigerators but most of the indian refrigerators are quite poor a typical 165 liter indian refrigerator consumes about 540 kwh per year whereas on the other hand the 200 liter korean model consumes about 240 kilowatt per hour per year now this high efficiency refrigerators are not manufactured in Hey, the, these refrigerators use a different compressor design, which are very sensitive to voltage of electric supply. Now, most of the times you will see that in our houses, uh, the uh, yeah, if you happen to buy these imported uh, uh, air conditioners or the uh, air refrigerators. they give away fast and that's because the electricity which we get is not uh, so much stable problems are particularly higher in the suburbs and outskirts of mumbai mumbai has a fairly stable uh, uh, voltage of uh, electrical supply so energy saving potential in different industrial equipments can come from boiler compressor furnace the diesel generating set or uh, a dg set uh, motor pump and refrigeration okay. the electric motors from the heart of the industries out of the total motors in operation 90 per 8 percent are induction motors and induction motors consume 70% of the total electrical energy generated so here we need to need to you know make a shift from induction motors to other type of motors the various uh, causes of energy loss in induction motors are due to over size motors are there then we have a classic example of rewound motors uh, i'm sure some of you may have seen even the fans etc which need to be uh, repaired they do the rewinding of the induction motors in the fans then improper voltage less efficient motor which is uh, 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 and the idle run so sizing sizing of motor plays a vital role in energy if you want to kill an ant you don't require a cannon ball you can just tap it and kill it and this is what happens that uh, people have variable uses so they tend to install the oversized induction motors which is actually consuming a lot of electrical energy then 
it becomes a problem also that uh, uh, you can use either the same uh, single use uh, uh, single stage induction motor or you can use the multiple stages and this creates a problem for the industry most of the times okay uh, a fan i was talking about when you enter a room and when you leave a room when you switch off and switch on the fans uh, a fan will require a larger torque for starting and then as per the newton's third law when it is in motion it requires less energy so switching off the fan all the time if I, if the rest period in between is not uh, more than say 5 to 10 minutes is going to cause uh, cost you more and is going to consume more electricity so continuous run of a fan will in that time will be better option rather than switching it off and on which also happens with the uh, oversized induction motors in the companies okay uh, people also want to have the uh, large size uh, uh, or oversized induction motors is because to have the excess cushion and safety factors and sometimes it's ad hoc decisions which uh, for example uh, uh, people buy inverter ac uh, nowadays and because inverter ACs are uh, more energy efficient. However, inverter in a, uh, uh, AC can only be utilized if it is going to be working for 10 to 12 hours continuously. That means in an office, it is a ideal kind of a motor which can be utilized. Whereas in homes, most of the time people tend to use the AC for about an hour or two and then switch it off and then you can live on a fan making a huge uh, saving on electricity. Now in that case using an inverter AC is a overkill because you are not going to be achieving any energy efficiency uh, from that and this kind of ad hoc uh, decisions are taken at household level even at factory. Okay. Revolved motors I, are basically uh, used uh, at uh, different uh, places, especially textile and paper industries, unorganized sectors, small scale industries, etc. Because it's cheaper. And once it is cheaper, that means it is best. But it is not that whatever cheapest is the best. Because over a time, it actually consumes more energy and you land up paying more cost for this. But most of these uh, players are small scale players and they are not able to make huge investments on the other kind of motors and they tend to go on the reward motors. So, Air compressors is another thing. Compressed air is used for various uses uh, in uh, industries and basically it accounts for a major share of electricity use in the plants. It is utilized for variety of end uses such as pneumatic tools and equipment, instrumentation, conveying, etc. And it's preferred in industries because of its convenience and it's quite safe to use. Compressed air is very energy intensive and only 5% of electrical energy is converted to useful energy. Use of compressed air for cleaning is relatively justified. Unsure low temperature of inlet air increase in inlet air or temperature by 3 degrees Celsius increases power consumption by 1%. And I have seen the use of uh, this compressed air for a variety of purposes in industries many a times you know people right from cleaning their cars to cleaning their shoes go for uh, this energy and uh, it is a colossal waste of energy in the industries which are using compressed airs so 
I'll skip this and come to cooling towers. Cooling towers are basically utilized uh, at uh, various uh, uh, industries, uh, especially for uh, the refineries and for uh, uh, the uh, thermal power plants. You require uh, cooling towers. Even in uh, some of the chemical industries, uh, cooling is a requirement. And uh, these cooling towers are basically specialized heat exchange in which two fluids, air and water, are brought into direct contact with each other to effect the transfer of heat. So, replacement of inefficient aluminium or fabricated steel fans by molded FRP fans with aerofoil designs results in electrical saving in the range of 15 to 40 percent, which is not happening in India. Install automatic on-off switching of cooling tower fans and save up to 40 percent of electrical cost. Then pumps is another uh, uh, major source uh, consumer of electrical energy and there are diff pumps are utilized for different purposes and they have tremendous difference in their capacities also. There are large pipelines for pumps which are utilized to trans uh, for, uh, transport uh, water or even uh, 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 mineral oils and the running of these uh, pumps can be colossal. Okay. Now you have uh, variable drives which can be utilized in these pumps and if those drives are utilized then energy efficiency of uh, the conveying system to pumps can be reduced. Okay. Select a pump of the right capacity in accordance with the requirement. Improper selection of pumps can lead to large wastage of energy. A pump with 85% efficiency at rated flow may have only 65% efficiency at half the flow. So, again, all these things basically require a proper planning when you are going to be installing such kind of uh, machines for uh, your factory setup or even at household setup. Refrigeration and air condition, yes, we did talk about it and uh, uh, it is used at uh, various uh, sources right from buildings to factories for different purposes. When you are at home uh, or in your college, the one thing which you can take precaution for is stop escape of cooled air from your, the place where air conditioners are being used or even refrigeration is being used. Many people have a habit of keeping the fridge door open and then uh, whatever, take your uh, ice cream and uh, properly put it in the bowl. By all this time, the fridge door is open, the efficiency reduces. Similarly, in our houses also, uh, the doors may have large gaps from where the air can go, uh, escape and this will put additional load on the air conditioners, which can be easily avoided if you can seal the places from where air is escaping. Okay. Oh, condenser, basically maintain condensers for proper heat exchange of five uh, degrees Celsius decrease in evaporator temperature increases the specific power consumption by 15%. The compression of the central air conditioner should be located in cool shaded places outside. Many a times look at your own air conditioners, uh, especially if you have the split air conditioners, uh, whether that particular side is getting directly sunlight or not. If it is getting that directly sunlight, your energy efficiency is reduced by at least 50%. 
second example i would like to give that uh, places like mumbai if you can have an additional dehumidifier to uh, your air conditioner your air conditioner again can become 50% more efficient than if you don't use dehumidified air some of the acs have built in uh, modes for the dry air and you can use the dry air mode because that will be humidified because humidity also uh, stores energy in it uh for buildings and i would like to give one example here uh, uh, if at all you can uh, visit uh, uh, cii center at uh, hyderabad uh, the green building center uh, they have used a tower wind tower of about uh, four story wind tower is there it's it's, it's a building with uh, uh, criss cross uh, placement of uh, uh uh bricks and water is poured onto these bricks now once the air which enters from top which is a hot air when it gets in contact with a wet brick the temperature drops and the air gets denser now this air keeps on getting denser at different levels of those brick meshes and by the time it reaches the compressor the air is already cooled by about 12 to 15 degrees celsius so your machine can work the air conditioner can work at only 30% capacity if you had not used this thing so there are different ways and means of using uh technology to improve the energy second thing is uh, at many places uh, uh, uh in the houses especially if you are using a uh, ac for your bedroom you don't need to cool the entire room or even if you are working your working table needs to be cooled you don't need the entire room to be cooled so you can have vents So in, uh, uh, adjusted in such a way that a direct flow of cool air can come only on you, and that way you can make your AC uh, uh, systems from almost twenty five to sixty percent more efficient just by adjusting the flows. See, lighting uh, again. If you use LED lights, they are the best. uh also when you are using halide la halogen lamps etc in the outskirts uh, look at the ipl cricket with where those large halogen lamps are utilized they also uh, give out a lot of heat and result into heating of the entire area uh so instead of these again led lights uh, if they are used uh, there is also a world bank uh, uh, project called ujala which is uh, being uh, 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 executed in india where uh, uh, over a next a uh, uh, yeah, few years they are going to be changing all municipal uh, street lights in right from villages to municipalities to nagar panchayat and they will be uh, uh, the uh, traditional incandescent bulbs will or hydro halogen lamps will be changed with led light lights and if whenever the uh, ecologically sensitive areas are there there is a particular uh, 3000 kelvin light which you can utilize which is safest to the animals so there is a lot of research research has already gone into this and more and more research is coming out in mumbai uh, this trans harbor lamp which is coming out which is actually uh, you going to be using these lamps so that flamingos which and other birds which uh, fly around they will get minimally distracted by the lights 
So boilers are used in various industrial units to convey heat for different process applications. Steam is commonly used in the heating medium mainly due to two reasons. One, it is generated from water, which is usually available. And two, it is able to store a large quantity of heat at a temperature, which can be conveniently used. So various types of fuels like coal, gas, biomass, etc., bagas are used for steam generation in boiler depending on the availability of fuel and cost economics prevailing in the plant. So uh, uh, a large amount of bagas uh, which comes from the sugarcane industry uh, that is directly burned into the boilers which are uh, not really efficient in terms of transferring the thermal energy into the energy which is required and desired for the particular plant. So uh, there are pellets, there is coal, uh, there is uh, 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 diesel. So different kinds of fuels are there. One needs to use the uh, appropriate uh, uh, fuel for that particular plant and that way one can actually ensure the efficiency is increased. Now in the boilers also, most people think that uh, there is a steam which is going to be utilized by using the boiler. So you can use any kind of water. No, what happens is as the water uh, evaporates at 100 degrees Celsius, so are many of the soluble uh, uh, ingredients in the water are also getting out into the uh, fumes and they do the scale formation. Now, a scale formation of one millimeter thickness on the water side increases fuel consumption by five to eight percent. So the water which needs to be used should be properly treated. All impurities have to be removed. Now this again, uh, cost. But then when you are looking at ultimate aim of energy conservation, well, you need to spend on these kind of things. Okay? Uh, steam leakages also happen most of the times. And just to give you an example, a leakage from a 3 mm diameter hole on pipeline carrying steam at 7 kg per centimeter square would waste 32 calories cal cal uh, cal cal of fuel oil, uh, kiloliters of fuel oil per year, uh, amounting to a loss of rupees 3 lakh. We are talking about 3 mm diameter. So all these systems need to be efficient, they need to be maintained if you want to come to a level where energy can be saved and energy saved is basically money saved. So there are three convertibles now when you are talking about energy. When you are talk about energy, you think of carbon and when you think of carbon, you think of money. Again, different kinds of DG sets are utilized and they are diesel generator, but now you have generators which can work on uh, right from LNG or uh, uh, PNG to even uh, the methane which is coming out of the biodigesters. So for a large uh, complex, if you can have biodigesters to take care of your wet waste, you can come out with uh, methane which can be utilized into your generators and you can uh, generate clean energy rather than depending on the diesel generators. Okay. Now, who is looking at all this? Uh, there are uh, energy audits which are carried out and these energy auditors basically inspect, analyze and evaluate the energy consumption they assess how much of energy in the industry uses and uh, pinpoints the opportunities for energy saving. So different kind of institutes carry their regular yearly energy audits and implement the outcome of the energy audits to make sure that your losses are minimal, maximum energy is saved.
again i talked about uh, reduction of uh, line losses by replacing smaller number of larger transformers with large number of smaller transformers located nearer to loads and thus reducing the length of the lt lines okay. this kind of uh, thing having large number of transformer transformers will ensure that only adequate supply is available and you are not overkilling the entire system one more uh, comparison i am giving transformer capacity a 25 kva a losses with silicon steel 100 watt losses with amorphous metal 25 watts okay. 63 kva 180 watts 45 watts 100 kva 260 watts 60 watts so what kind of these amorphous core transformers can do you know, so that your energy efficiency is maintained it's given here then our everyday lights what we can do insulating turning off lights only using appliances like dishwashers when they are full are just some of the ways in which people can limit energy. I know a friend of mine who could use a washing machine for merely three handkerchiefs, one towel, and two pairs of shorts. Now, that kind of colossal waste is there at household levels. It, it also, when you multiply it by number of people in this country, uh, you can imagine what kind of losses are there. Okay, turn off all electronic devices that are not in use, not only turn off, but try to re remember to unplug them. You will be surprised how much you will save with this simple step because even when unplugged, there is a current flowing from the systems all the time. Okay? Car pulling, bicyclic, and taking public transportation are effective energy saving ideas. I am sure with metros running all around in Mumbai and many other cities can actually reduce the energy consumption of fuels because it is a reliable and fast way of transporting people. The energy intensity per unit gross domestic product, a, a product that is GDP, is much higher in India, 3.7 times of Japan, 1.5 times of USA than many of the countries of the world, leading to the high wastage of energy, power store shortage, and uncompetitive product pricing, hindering international trade. So, we have 25,000 megawatt of assessed potential of energy saving, and that can only be achieved if we all work together. Energy conservation measures can reduce peak and average demand so that there is a lesser fluctuation. One unit saved avoids 2.5 to 3 times of fresh capacity addition. Investment in energy conservation is highly cost effective, can be achieved less than rupees one crore per megawatt. Are there any laws to protect this? Yes. In India, the Energy Conservation Act was enacted in October 2001. It became effective from 1st March 2002. Bureau of Energy Efficiencies BEE operationalized from 1st March 2002. If you are planning to buy any of the electrical appliances, try to get maximum BEE points from that. Okay. Evolved minimum energy consumption and performances standards for notified equipment and appliances prohibit manufacture and sale of equipment and appliances not conforming to standards. Introduce mandatory labeling to enable consumers to make informed choice. Okay. So, 
what are the standards and levels? Energy efficiency standards are sets of procedures and regulation that prescribe the energy performance of a manufactured product, sometimes prohibiting the sale of product less energy efficient than the minimum standard. Don't buy it. Labels, energy efficiency labels are informative labels affixed to manufactured products indicating a product's energy performance in order to provide consumers with the data necessary for making informed purchases. Okay. Important roles include implementation of provision of Energy Conservation Act, quick coordination, policy research, promotion of energy efficiency, development of new financial instruments, awareness creation, which is what we are doing today. So India is observing 14 December as Energy Conservation Day to create awareness among people. For on this day, try to consume minimum energy. And I can tell you from my own example, it, it really doesn't harm you. I have a farmhouse. Uh, I have not taken electricity over there. I purchased it in 2006. And whenever I go there, I live without electricity. And uh, it's not so much of a problem. And if you can get used to it, I think you can be rest assured that a lot of your mental burdens also reduces because we are highly dependent on energy sometimes or many a times unnecessarily. Finally, I, I am over with my long lecture and thank you for patient listening and it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was indeed informative. Um, and uh, we do have a, a couple of questions the students have uh, conveyed. May I just put one, one question forward? Yeah. Uh, so ma'am, uh, so one student is asking, what are, is there a literature, is there any particular source where they can go and refer to in case they want to know a little bit about their consumption or something? Is there a way they can go and find out in what way can they reduce it? So are there any sources where they can get more such information? Yes, there are a number of uh, sources uh, where it is available. Uh, you can go to the government website itself. There are a lot of references and resources which are available on this subject. Uh, plus, there are many institutes which are working mainly, even United Nations uh, is having a lot of information on uh, the uh, energy saving uh, methods and what can be done at society level, what can be done at individual level, what can be done at industrial levels. Also, if you uh, look at all these international conventions uh, which uh, took place uh, with the UN or uh, now the Uh, so we're unable to hear your voice. No, sir. At least I'm not able. Yes, now it's fine. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there is a, uh, yeah, I think my internet connection has gone a little unstable. Okay. Uh, there's a plethora of information is available on all these websites. So uh, one can uh, definitely uh, take information from and uh, there is also called ECBC, that is the uh, energy uh, uh, code for uh, the building, uh, 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 for building needs. So can we take one? Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it's been quite informative and most things have been covered. Just one last question, uh, if I may yeah. ask. A uh, student has been asking if the energy audit, which you mentioned for industries, can we get it done? Is there any such thing for household level to know, you know, where energy is getting wasted or where this is what the student wanted to ask? I mean, just conveying it to you. Yeah, just a minute. Yes, sir.
yeah, sorry. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Shall I ask the question? Yeah, no, no. Uh, basically, there are energy auditors. And uh, these energy auditors are uh, recognized energy auditors, just like chartered accountants. Now, they can come and they can work on uh, uh, various uh, levels. Uh, household level, it really doesn't work. But definitely, it works at building or society level and above. Because what happens is uh, there, when you work at a household level, there are going to be minuscule changes which are not going to be seen immediately unless or until you wait for a long period. So people don't depend on uh, these kind of sources. And to invite somebody and get your household uh, uh, energy uh, uh, audit done is not going to be useful. But at society level, level, yes, because the same kind of implementation of suggestions can be done by every household and that is where you will see the change. So when we are also doing, when we work on various uh, buildings, etc., we suggest uh, certain requirements are there and uh, the builders need to fulfill those unless and until they do that, they do not get the occupation certificate which is checked by the pollution control. And uh, uh, it is also mandatory for actually many of most of the societies to carry out their uh, energy audits. But because the uh, system has not been developed at government uh, level uh, to go and check with, you know, every uh, society and uh, check for their uh, uh, energy audits, uh, it's not working as of now, but in next 10 years, I think this will become mandatory for every housing society in the country. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we've uh, we've come to the end of our session right now. And uh, before we go to a formal vote of thanks, I'd like to thank you for the enriching, insightful, informative session you showed us through eye-opening statistics and facts about how we are wasting energy on our daily life and the dire need to conserve it. And thank you also for showing that every small step we take can make a big difference uh, in conserving energy. So we at ML Dhanukar College have joined oh, wow. the movement and uh, we are fortunate to have you as our mentor in this initiative. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now, thank you so much. Sir. Uh, so now I would like to request uh, our respected Vice Principal Srimati Chandana Chakravarti, ma'am, to propose a vote of thanks. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Shivani. Uh, it is indeed an honor to propose a formal vote of thanks to our speaker for the day. So on behalf of Palatilak Vidyalaya Association's ML Danukar College of Commerce, I convey my sincere thanks to the speaker, Dr. Vivek Kulkarni, for gracefully accepting our, uh, you know, request at such a short notice and imparting with such uh, a enlightening session on various aspects of energy, uh, right from the basics to, you know, how small steps can be taken at every end to a conserve energy. I'm also thankful to all the viewers today, uh, my colleagues, friends who are here, who have joined the session, students who are also a part of this um, session that we are conducting. And uh, our principal uh, is not in the country, but he the time zone is different, but he has also joined in today for this very important session that we have had uh, because unless and until we as citizens of this earth, we try in our own small ways to make a difference, the future of this earth is really at a stake. So I'm thankful to all present today here for joining with this session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so we are very sure that the session proved to be extremely beneficial to one and all. We hope that you are, you continue to inspire people like us in conserving energy for a sustainable future. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you, everyone. Thank you.